Hello um, and welcome um, to another episode. My name is Ayo. Welcome to the, to the channel. Um, as I spoke, I spoke hopefully not too much at length last uh, last time about um, some doctrine I wanted to to approach and to to correct. Um, and in the light of that previous um, little talk, I want to just talk a bit further about some other doctrinal things that I'd like to address from a biblical point of view. Uh, hopefully from now on I'll, be, I'll do a mixture of, of things like correcting error, um, particular talks on certain areas, illuminating stuff, a bit of discernment. So trying to hopefully try and give a, a, a quite an all-rounded um, approach to, to Christianity. Uh, and so in the light of this I want to talk about a particular doctrine which is which is very prevalent nowadays. Obviously my, my take on it is going to be Obviously limited. I don't want to go too far into into it because it's it's a huge subject in itself, and many greater men have done greater expositions of it. But I just want to explore it on a from my personal view and and try and kind of hopefully get some clarity as to why this particular doctrine is uh, is wrong and and how it affects everything. Um, as I spoke briefly last time, that obviously I was previously in a, a Bethel style church and have come out of it. And one of the one of the things that has made my journey so What's so enlightening is the fact that the Holy Spirit has helped me to step back and actually look at what I believe and why I believe it and to examine it in the light of Scripture as opposed to just saying this is something I've always learnt. And so today this particular one is it's going to put me at a lot with a lot of people um, within my immediate community and a lot of the, the people out there generally speaking but it, it's the aspect of, of Dominion Theology. Um, and so hopefully in the next, I don't want to spend too long, but hopefully within an hour, um, just to speak about it and to explore it, um, its roots, its nascence, and its its kind of effect going forward. I hate that expression, so I'll try not to use it again. So let's 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 delve into this. So Dominion Theology is predicated on the belief that man has essentially full control and authority over this planet. Um, it's believed, basically looking from Genesis 1, um, verse 26 to 29, that essentially man, God's first command, first mandate to, to, to men was to, to go and rule and to dominate and to reign, as it were, as gods on this planet. So let's just read that. Let's read what Genesis 1, 26, 29, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So, at the core of this doctrine is the idea that men are created to rule, as it were, as gods on earth, with the power and the spirit of the Almighty himself. Um, and so, when you take this mandate, as it were, and you, you compare it, or at least you, you juxtapose it with, for example, Psalm 82, Verse 6, where the psalmist says, I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. You can see how this starts to paint a picture and reinforce the idea that we are gods, as it were. And again, the problem is, is that many of these things are taken out of context. When, we, when he speaks of God here, he's talking about the, the princes and the rulers and the judges of this earth. And so it's speaking specifically about a particular demographic within the Israelite community, i.e., the, the judges and the rulers, as it were, of the of God's law, who administer God's law. But again, it's taken out of context. And then when you when you look in the wider context of the Bible, anyway, when God speaks of gods, as it were, anyone or anything that calls itself a god, it's always sarcastically and often with derision. So to then appropriate this idea or this this calling as gods upon ourselves is is not a good start. So kind of the. The driving force behind the theology is that whereas most Christians, or at least I, would, I hope that most Christians would see the translation or the application of this, this of, of Genesis 1 as kind of a, 
a role to be a steward, as it were, to almost have a, a parental kind of authority over the earth. In the same way that we are parents over our kids, we don't own our kids, we are, we're stewards of our kids. And in the fact that we have dominion, it's essentially we are at the top of the food chain. There is no creature on earth that supersedes us. So essentially every, we dictate terms. We, we decide which animals die, which animals we eat, where we decide to live. Uh, and every other animal, everything on this earth is subservient to us in that respect. So that's just what I think most Christians should see or do see our role within the, um, the hermeneutics of this particular passage. Whereas from a, a dominion theology point of view, it's more, uh, they, kind of tr they kind of translate or at least interpret it as a, a mandate to go and exercise dominion, to, to rule and to, to exert power and authority. But as we see from the passage, it's essentially talking about the physical world over the fish, over the sea, over the plants, as it were. So these things are for us. But the problem is, is that what they do is they actually step beyond the bounds of what it says in Scripture and they they apply it over men as well, over society and over the affairs of other human beings. And the irony of this is that Jesus himself says when he's talking to the Pharisees in, in Matthew, when they accuse him for of, um, driving out Beelzebub by the power of Beelzebub, what does he say? He says that a kingdom against itself cannot stand. It, it's divided. So if humans are to rule over humans, then essentially that's a kingdom divided. So already we've seen that there's fractures and there's an inconsistency with scripture about this particular theology. So the position of authority kind of from their doctrine, it's then essentially from the fall this dominion, as it were, was arrested from us and was given to Satan, who tricked us into essentially giving him authority and power over the earth. And, and of course, the, the, the Bible doesn't deny this. If we read in 1 John 5, verse 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the, the Bible doesn't deny this. I mean, this is a truth in itself that, yes, in, in many respects, Satan is the ruler of this world. But it is not the truth, as it were. And, and the problem, like most heresies, is that at the, at the grain of every lie is a truth. But that truth becomes distorted. And then once that truth is taken out of its context, uh, it becomes a lie. So it's really important. That I'm sure many people have heard the term that a text out of context, you're left with a lie. And ironically, I heard that <laughs> from uh, Joseph Prince, of all people. So... That's the uh, one of the greatest uh, dramatic ironies you'll ever hear. But it's true, if you take a text out of its context and ignore the co-text, you, you make it a pretext. And if you do not measure truth in relation to the truth, i.e. Jesus Christ, it essentially becomes a lie. And, and when you start making things a truth in itself outside of Jesus Christ, it no longer becomes true. Um, a simple example would be, we are called to be holy. We are called to be separate unto the Lord which is obviously a truth. But then if you then take that truth and then you make holiness your raison d'etre without Christ, then it then becomes a lie because then you are almost worshipping holiness. Holiness, therefore, becomes your God as opposed to what do you separate yourself onto or away from? What do you separate? Without the truth of Christ with which to measure this truth, then all you're doing is isolating yourself and you're just separating yourself, you know, just loneliness. So... Holiness in and of itself is not a truth. Holiness unto the Lord is a truth. And so it's really important that we make sure that we measure all truths in conjunction with the truth. And indeed, the truth is that after the fall, yes, the, the world was subject to decay because through, through one man's sins, we're told in Romans, you know, sin entered into the world. And we're told in Genesis 2, um, verse 7, that the Lord formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils of life. Therefore, physically, we are of the earth. And there is a, there is a definite symbiosis between the, the physical world and human beings because we are from the earth. And so, as, of course, because when sin entered into the world, before we, we sinned, there was no death, there was no decay, everything was perfect. And so as soon as man sinned, therefore stuff started dying because we are part of the earth. And then obviously from the fall and subsequently from today, from to this current time until Christ comes again, man continually, continually rejects God. 
obviously you get you know, some sort of patterns of of every of the remnant church and you know when the the Jews return back to to God, but generally speaking, it's just been a steady decay of of man denying the authority of God. And in that sense, when you deny God His authority and His power over our lives, it has to go somewhere. There is no vacuum in nature, so by default, you know, authority is then given over to Satan because we've wanted you know the libertarian kind of enticement that he brings and the options that satan brings and as a result he has accumulated and accrued all this authority and power over the kingdoms of the earth because man has essentially denied god his power and his authority over his life and again this is again to, to show that this is true when we when we look at um the temptation in the wilderness when we go to matthew 4 verse 8 to 9 of the three temptations, which we will talk about um, in slightly more depth later on, um, the final temptation is that, as we read in verse 8 to 9, it says, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So, the Bible doesn't say, or Jesus doesn't say, that's not true. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't deny. We don't see Jesus denying that this in fact is true. And so that's so it's, it's safe to say that yes, Satan does have at least a measure of authority and control over the kingdoms of this world. But to make this side truth the main truth, we turn it into a lie. And as uh, as I've heard in, in a particular um, preacher, you know. Again, if you if you take a central if you take a side truth and make it the central truth, you turn that truth into a lie, and this is the problem: is that you start to depart from the truth. Is that even this small, slight kind of shift of emphasis can have a dramatic and damaging effect on on doctrine going forward. This is why it's really important. We're told in Corinthians is to is to make sure that our foundations are Christ as the cornerstone and the foundation laid by the by the apostles. By their teachings, we can't, we cannot err in any way, shape, or form from what they teach. An example of this would be: um, I'm of a scientific background, um, and so when you're doing mathematical equations, or you know, especially derivations at GCSE, but also A level and, and degree level, you're always told to show you're working. And this is this is because you need to. We need to see what it is. If they ask to derive so and so. Obviously, if it's for 20 marks, obviously there's going to be quite a degree of, of complexity, and there's no point in just answer, writing down an answer. Because if you get it right, you might have got it by fluke, you know, or you might have just memorized it. There's no sort of show of understanding there. Whereas if you get it wrong, you may have got it wrong by something, a slight error along the way, especially if it's like a 30-step a derivation. So it's important to show you're working. And this is why. Right at the beginning, I've seen it many times, right at the beginning of the equation derivation, you may have started with, for example, minus 4 divided by minus 2, blah, 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 blah. And then in your rush or in the pressure, you, you write minus 2. Well, that's wrong. It's minus 4 divided by minus 2 is 2. Obviously, two negatives make a plus. But then in your rush, you've, you've accidentally made the mistake. And then as a result, everything that you... Use every time you plug that value into subsequent kind of steps of the equation, you're obviously getting further and further away from the truth. And this is the same with getting core doctrine wrong. And again, another metaphor would be doing DIY, simple DIY. If you're laying up you know, tiling, for example, you may start nice and straight, but if you deviate ever so slightly by just a, a fraction of the degree, depending on how big the wall is you're doing, you'll find that after a certain while, you step back. And you realise that something dead straight, you're like that. And then you look across and it looks hideous. But obviously when you've got your face to the, your nose to the cold face, you, you don't see it. And, you, and it, you have to step back and look and examine what you've done. And I go back and look, where exactly did I depart from, from the truth as it were? And so this is hopefully what I'm, I'm trying to engender in, in people is to, to make sure that you look at what you believe and why you believe it. And make sure that you measure it with the Bible. Make, the Bible is the the plumb line and we must always make sure that everything we do especially from our core doctrinal beliefs is in 100 percent accordance with what the bible says and so this errant core belief has led to the notion that because we're rulers on this earth that god somehow needs permission to do anything on earth because we in fact are the rulers of the planet earth it's like 
again, just to just to use another metaphor, another example is that, you know, as a parent, you give your pet, you give your kid his room, and you say, "Look after your room." Does that room belong to the kid? No, the house belongs to you, and you give them an area for them to look after, to see us, to clean, to maintain, to look after. You give them a, a degree of freedom with which to decorate it, how to decorate it, but not to start, you know, making wholesale changes and destroy the fabric of that room. Of course not. But yet, Dominion Theology would suggest that that room is entirely yours, and if your parents want to come in, they need your permission. And again, I don't know about you, but if my parents knock, it is a courtesy. It is a courtesy they afford me simply by the fact they love me. It is not that they require my, my permission with which to enter the room. It is simply a courtesy. So when God does things through us, it is a courtesy. It is a, an expression of his love for us. It's, it's, you know, help me do these things, you know, because I love you in the same way that, you know, I have a son, a four-year-old son, is that, you know, I ask you get him to help me. Not that I need his help. In fact, sometimes it's a bit of a hindrance, but because I love him, I ask him to come and do these things with me. It's just an expression of my love. And so when we pray to God, it's not that we need his permission. Oh, sorry, he needs our permission. He's just exercising love and grace upon us. And so it leads to, I'll leave a link below uh, of a, a talk, hopefully about a 20-minute talk by um, by Morial TV about Dominion Theology. And you'll see, um, I think about 10 minutes in, I can't remember how long in, but you see a um, supposed man of God talking about how God needs permission to do anything on earth. Our prayer is giving God permission to interfere on the affairs of, of man, or to interfere in the affairs on this earth. I mean, that's, from my understanding, that's absolute blasphemy. And again, in another part, there's a, there's a Jewish um, supposed Christian talking about essentially God needs a legal precedent by which to do things. Otherwise, he cannot physically do them. He constrains himself, as it were. So he puts that caveat that God constrains himself and therefore requires legal precedent from us to allow him to do these things on earth. And the, in, the, in, in, the, in the talk, in the link, they give the example of in order for God to send Jesus Christ to die for us, he needs to have a legal precedent, i.e. Abraham and Isaac. It's like, so it's, it's saying that in order for God to send Jesus, he needs to have established a legal precedent. Therefore, he required and he needed Abraham to at least make the proposition to sacrifice his son. Therefore, God now has a legal precedent by which to make atonement for our sin. You know, this this is really dangerous. This is I can't understand. I can't understate how dangerous and how blasphemous this kind of line of belief this exaggerated belief in our in our divinity <laughs> we have none we have no divinity in us we we, we can't create or do anything but it, it's it's dangerous because when you start to see your role in, in this world as it is as though you are rulers of this planet by extension you you view the cross in a very different way so instead of the cross primarily being um, kind of like the mechanism for which atonement for sin is made, reconcili reconciliation is established with the Father through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we live vicariously through him in order to do that, and therefore the cross represents that moment in time where the veil is torn down and we now have kind of restoration with God, as it were. In Dominion Theology, that restoration isn't of fellowship with the Father, it's of dominion. So, to reiterate, Jesus' death and resurrection is primarily to restore dominion. Yes, blah, 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 yes, okay, to source sin, but in the eyes of men who, you know, kind of champion this theology, it's about restoring dominion. And again, I can't understate how negative and destructive this impact has on the evolution of one's doctrine. And it spawns all sorts of heresies, uh, and it's really prevalent today. There's always been, you know, flare-ups of it, but really today, it's, it's, it has a really profound effect on, on modern Christendom. And so, you see, in its kind of really, excuse me, extreme militant form, you have um, basically Christian reconstructionism, 
and this is basically the aim of doing away with kind of liberal democracy and establishing an Old Testament style kind of institution with Old Testament kind of penalties and, and law essentially bring us back under the law. Obviously, this is an extreme end of it, uh, and it's something actually that's championed a lot in the um, the Latin South American countries. This is really prevalent over there, and you'll see a lot of kind of you know dominion kind of evangelicism, especially in South America. But also, you see the softer side. There's the, the softer cell of, of that spectrum, which is called Kingdom Now theology, or Kingdom theology, and hopefully some of us are aware of this, it's something that's very much kind of championed by the uh, NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, it's kind of all about, again, it's the, the drive to re-establish God's kingdom on earth. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the, the Seven Mountain Mandate, where you've got to basically conquer the mountain of education, of of the home, of media, blah, blah, blah. blah. I can't remember what all of them are. But again, it, it's, it's spawned from... This, this theological aspiration to, to conquer the world and to re-establish, you know, man's rule, godly man's rule over the earth. And so, naturally, this leads to a post-millennial eschatology. So, their, their view of the end times is that Christ will only come once that kind of millennial reign is established, then Jesus Christ will come. But the problem is that they see that their, that reign is through the church. So Christ doesn't reign in and of himself. He reigns through the church. And again, I'm hopefully you're seeing the, the, um, how the dominionist kind of theology runs through. It's that Jesus can't, God can't do things in and of himself. He has to do it through man. So man becomes God's equal and God's partner in that respect. And so this kind of dominion end time, kind of post-millennial eschatology necessitates God has to work through man. God... Apparently, Jesus Christ cannot be, you know, <laughs> ruled on his own, even though the the prophecies of, of Isaiah and, and Jeremiah obviously speak of just Christ, you know, the son of David ruling in his entirety. But modern kind of interpretations means it has to be through the church, even though I can, I personally cannot see any anything, any hermeneutics that will suggest that Jesus Christ has to reign through the church. But again, this this is what happens is that when you have this, your theology, it runs through and it permeates everything you think about and how you view your Christianity. And it's dangerous. And again, as I say, we, we can see how this, this core doctrine pervades everything. And this is almost, it, it's it's bad because it's it's antichrist in its, in its theology. It, it kind of puts us in the place of Christ. It's instead of Christ having the authority and the dominion over us, it's actually us and Christ. So antichrist literally means not, not just necessarily contrary to Christ, but in the place of Christ. And and this is dangerous. And and another aspect of I want to see, I want to explore, um, for me, it's essentially the two sides of the same coin. It's, it's simply the same doctrinal belief, but expressed slightly differently. And that's the word of faith. So this is really, this is really prevalent today. And I'm hopefully, I want to explore why it's dangerous and I'm, why it's something we need to know and be and savvy about so that we don't fall into into the traps into the lure that they have so where dominion theology uses its idea of restored dominion to advance the kingdom as it were it you could, there's almost a, 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 a genuine sense of altruism that they, they generally want to kind of establish god's kingdom here on earth whereas word of faith takes that idea of dominion and applies it selfishly as it were and it's more self-seeking it's more about your personal dominion about the things around you and so and the core the core of this belief system essentially is the exercising this dominion is made manifest in your faith hence word of faith so the word of faith teaches and i've taken this directly from online source is that your physical, emotional, financial, relational, and spiritual healing or prosperity for those who skillfully manage their covenant with God. That's basically it. If you can manage your covenant with God, you should be working in perfect physical, emotional, financial, relational, and spiritual healing and prosperity. And they urge believers to speak what they desire in agreement with the promises 
and the provisions of the Bible as an affirmation of God's plans and purposes. So if we go to Mark eleven twenty two to 24, we read, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now this kind of passage is pretty much the MO of the World of Faith movement. They take this passage, kind of ignore the wider context, and just basically say, yeah, look, Jesus Christ himself says, if you want anything, you believe in your heart, you'll have it. We'll, we'll, we'll explore that further. But the actual word, the actual term word of faith comes actually directly from Romans 10 verse 8, um, which we read, it says, but what does he say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So let me just reiterate, it says in Romans 10 8, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So, I think historically, I don't know exactly, you know, I couldn't say dogmatically this is exactly where they get it from, but it is believed that essentially the term word of faith comes from this passage. But even if, and this is why it's important to read everything within within this context, what is this word of faith that, that uh, Paul is talking about? You just have to read verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <laughs> we can all do ourselves a massive favour and actually read the full context and understand that the true word of faith is that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. That's it. It's, it's staggering how, as Christians, we just we sit there and we listen to a preacher He'll start taking, I've heard firsthand, I've seen a preacher literally, not only is he kind of, you know, taking verses out of context, he's actually missed out swathes of a, of a text that doesn't agree with him within the same sentence, with literally within two commas of a sentence, just leave it out because it doesn't agree with what he says and then presents it as truth. And people don't even pick up their Bible to check if it's true. This is what we do, we do all the time. Well, what's such a we? I won't say we. This is what word of faith preachers do all the time. And it's, we should be Bereans. We should read our Bible, read the full context. Read the, If someone gives you a, a verse, read the whole chapter. I know we don't like reading nowadays. We like things pumped into our eyes visually. But sometimes just sit down and read the full context. And it, it's made clear. The Bible, there's no other standard by which the Bible can be interpreted by the, by the Bible itself. And so, with this in mind, I just want to briefly explore the history of, of, the, of Word of Faith. Uh, just, you know, because I'm very curious about these things. Um, I'll leave a link down below because there's a particular um, paper that I was reading, which is, is very good, um, extremely enlightening. Uh, and it's all about basically who's believed to be the the godfather of Word of Faith, which is E.W. Kenyon. Excuse me. So with the arrival of the 20th century, especially America, American Christianity was embattled within and without. Again, I'm, I'm quoting kind of paraphrasing um, some of the lines from the from the article. High criticism and Darwinianism uh, challenged the church doctrine from the middle of the 19th century, causing many within the church to doubt and vast volumes to even leave the faith altogether. So you had scientific materialism on one hand, and then you had religion and Christianity on the other hand, and the latter was losing ground rapidly. So then arrives uh, a chap called Essex William Kenyon, E.W. Kenyon, born 1867 to 1948. And around the age of 17, 18, he was, uh, he was converted in a, um, a Methodist prayer meeting. Uh, he then later became a member, um, a serving deacon uh, with, the, with the church. Um, but then he suffered a kind of crisis of faith, um, which was brought, in, brought on in part by the the spiritual zeitgeist of the age at the time obviously there was a lot of turmoil a lot of kind of confusion and aggressive attack from uh as i said scientific materialism but also brought on, brought on by kind of the wishy-washy or at least the 
inconsistent and confusing kind of biblical teachings of his mentors. Uh, and I think for about two and a half years, I believe, uh, there was a, he kind of had a bit of a, a spiritual hiatus and he, and he went off for a while. Um, and it is believed that it was during this period that he kind of found a solution to combat his his personal and um, his personal kind of crisis, and he hoped to kind of you know address the um, and, produce, and provide a solution to to combat the onslaught of this rising kind of assault on on Christianity or at least Orthodox Christianity. And so, unfortunately, it would seem that he got most of his influence from the growing the rise of Christian science, unity and new thought. Uh, and all these, these movements, along with many, um, practice what's called mind cure, um, which grew out of transcend, 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 transcendentalism. I'm not even sure I've pronounced that properly. Transcendentalism. Um, <laughs> which was born out of a reaction to rationalism um, and its philosophies. And it kind of, its kind of philosoph philosophical drive was that divinity pervaded all of nature and humanity um, and, and those who held to that were also held to progressivism and feminism and everything basically that pushed things forward and sought to explore new grounds in, in the melding of, of the physical and the, and the spiritual. And so Mind Cure what is like the, was the mastery of the physical conditions through understanding and applying mental and spiritual laws. So essentially it was transcendentalism with Eastern mysticism. So you can see this is already, it was blurring the lines. And so it would seem that during his kind of um, time out, he absorbed a lot of these school of thoughts from the college in which he enrolled in, which was, um, was about the, I think it was the only, the only college that he actually stayed more than a semester in, which was Emerson College of Oratory, uh, I think Boston. Um, so in an attempt to combat these heresies, Kenyon formed the kind of biblical version of Christianity which would try and capture those of the new thought um, but point them in the way of the Bible. So you can see this is already dangerous ground we're on. We're, we're swinging from one pendulum to another and trying to, to blend two things which are not meant to blend, they're oil and water. And so by incorporating the laws of attraction and many of the things that embodied and changing states of consciousness and the universality, the universality of God in, in the fabric of matter, he essentially used the Bible to point Christians in a kind of new thought middle ground. It's essentially what it is. You can't really dress it up any other way. It was essentially a middle ground between biblical Christianity and new thought, essentially correcting error with error. And this is the problem that modern Christianity and Christendom faces is that by nature, we swing from one pendulum to another. If you've been under one form of constraint, you will flee to liberty. If you felt too much liberty, you'll, you'll flee to constraint. And you end up kind of seesawing between the two. And you really need, as I said in my previous, my previous video, that you need to find that middle ground. It's essential. And so armed with this fresh point of view, Kenyon reinterpreted the Bible along these lines. And so his primary kind of modus operandi was, was the use of positive confession, this kind of law of detraction, from, especially from New Thought as the intermediary. It was the kind of way, it was the kind of middle ground that he thought he could bring people to, to a kind of entente cordiale. So in order for this to take traction, you have to basically redefine things. And the main thing that get, got redefined is the word faith. So no longer is faith as the Bible defines it, i.e. belief in and trust in God and submission to his divine will. Now, faith becomes believing God to deliver for you. Believing in things that you want. As it were, faith in faith. And so there's there's so many texts that are taken out of context, but I, I just want to touch on a few. Uh, one of the pivotal ones would be Hebrews 11, verse 1. And this again, it re, we read Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So previous hermeneutics, a previous understanding would have been to read the rest of the text. 
and as you see, this is like the the Hall of Fame of of, of faith uh, throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. And for me, it is absolutely clear that what the Bible the Bible talks about faith, it means faith in God. None of these guys had a dream that they need to fulfill and they need to kind of establish and they use God as their means to do it. It's simply a list of people who believe God for what he said and held on to it. That's it. But now you, you reinterpret that as faith is believing in substance of stuff that you want and you hope for that hasn't yet manifested. And it, it is a really beautiful text in, in, for them. It's a real loaded weapon that you can point to this and say, well, the Bible says, if you haven't seen it yet, you can dream it. And it's it's really dangerous because for those of us who don't read our Bibles and or at least study our Bibles, I shouldn't just say read, study our Bibles, this would make perfect sense. And so they go through, and let me just give you a few texts which I've come across. I mean, it's not exhaustive, believe me, there's 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 hundreds and hundreds. But for example, we talk about Job twenty two, twenty eight, where Eliaz is Eliaz is giving advice to Job, and he says, Thou shalt decree a thing that shall be established. Again, that's, yeah, the Bible says that, but then if you go to the end of Job, Job 40, what does God say about Eliphaz and, the, and Job's other two friends? He says to Job, he says, I'm so disgusted with what they've said to you that if you don't pray for them, I will not forgive their sins. So basically everything that these, these friends said to him, God hated and basically said, because of what they said, if you don't pray for them, I won't forgive them. And yet we go and quote that and use that as, as, as words for us. And Job 38, uh, 12, with God, God says to Job, have you commanded the morning? It's a rhetorical question. Have you commanded the morning? As in, were you there when I was making creation? Which obviously the answer to it is no. But then I've seen word of faith people say, take that out of context and say, look, you should go and command the morning. God's asking, have you done that? Have you commanded the morning? No, that's not what it means. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <sighs> I mean, that speaks for itself. I mean, if you listen to um, Spencer Smith on his um, his channel, I love it. His, uh, his version is, uh, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context, <laughs> which pretty much is this. I mean, just go and read the full context to understand what it's talking about. Another one. Okay, let's go to Mark 9, 21 to 24. This is another good one. This is another one which kind of puts the onus on you to believe. So this is um, when the uh, father brings his son to Jesus, who's had... Um, ever since birth, well, not some child that he's had a, a this spirit. And it says, so he, so he asked his father, I, Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? Because he's been having fits and convulsing. And he says, from childhood. And often he is thrown in both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So again, they'll say that it's your unbelief. It's not because it's because you're not believing hard enough for it that you've not got it. Which again, if you read the context, it's belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. I believe in you. They, these guys would have seen Jesus doing all sorts of miracles. It's not the fact they can't believe in him; he can't do it. But it's almost it's more the fact that his unbelief in Jesus Christ as the Savior to heal, as it were. So almost this idea that Jesus can only do things as a sh as a you know, the shaman. Whereas he, he doesn't believe that Christ is the Lord, he's, he is the Christ. So that's, that's what it's saying. But again, it, it's all about, well, if you didn't believe hard enough, Jesus is basically saying to him, you didn't believe hard enough, which, again, is not the, full, the proper context of what's written here. And so it's all the emphasis on sp in speaking positively, that law of attraction. You say something positive, it will come back to you. And so the ver reverse, especially with the you know word of faith, is that you know don't speak negative things. And they'll, they'll use stuff like, what Job says in Job 3.25 says, the thing that I, I feared most has come upon me. That, again, is just a descriptive text. It's not a prescriptive text. There's no other part of the Bible that says that. It, it just, you're just describing what he said. It was just, you know, him just airing himself, and the Bible documents it. But again, they'll say, oh, it's negative possession. Because he said it, it came upon him. No, no, no it wasn't that. It's because Job is a, a, um, is a Christ um, typology. And there's many, many things, especially the thing about Job is that, like Christ, he was seen, he was deemed stricken by God, even though he knew no sin, as it were. So this is, if you read the book of Job through the, the lens of understanding that he's a, type, a Christ typology, then this makes more sense. But again, they see this as a negative creation because he said it, 
it happened to him, whereas that's not the case. And again, they will, they'll turn to Proverbs 18, verse 21, and they'll say, Life and death is in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I mean, again, it's, it's like an idiom. It's, it's like the expression, you know, loose lips sink ships. It's basically saying, watch what you say, because, you know, you can cause a lot of damage by what you say. Not quite literally, you know, if my lips aren't sealed together, then a Type, 20, a type 45 destroyer off the coast of Portsmouth will, will sink inexplicably. Of course it doesn't mean that. So in the, in the sense, we don't literally have the power of life and death in our mouth. We cannot call, we can't say, I can't say to, you know, the bird across the road, drop dead. People say it all the time, drop dead. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to see anyone who's actually called someone to drop dead unless they're using satanic powers. Again, this is not what it means, but it, it's, it's when you view it through the lens of this understanding of dominionism, then you, you start to contort the meaning and, it, and it, it's not true. Well, see, these are just a, a, a few passages, a handful of passages but the real question I want to ask is, is this hermeneutic inherently wrong? And if so, what does the Bible have to say about it? Because I can say these things, but what does the Bible say about it? And it's probably the most important thing that we need to measure everything by is what the Bible says. And what does the Bible say about declare, declaring and decreeing things in and of yourself? And so for me, the definitive answer comes in the temptations in the wilderness. Um, that we have, well, we use the account of Matthew. But here we see that Satan tries to tempt Jesus using his three kind of modes of attack. He has three kind of ways of, of, of bringing sin or tempting people. As we read in John, 1 John 2.16, 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So essentially these three types of lines of attack is Satan's MO for tempting people. And so he tried the same with Jesus. And so when we see the temptation in the wilderness, when we go to the book of Matthew, Matthew 4, we see the first, this first attempt is the lust of the flesh, where he tries to get Jesus to turn food, bread, um, stones into bread. The third temptation, he gives him all the things of the world. He says, look, by Dan, so the lust of the eyes. But the second temptation that he uses is the pride of life. And this is the one that we want, I really want to focus on. Because Jesus, Satan tries to get Jesus to essentially use his status as the Son of God to do something that God the Father has not expressly told him to do. And this is the point. He's trying to get Jesus to do that which God has not expressly told him to do. He says, if you are the Son of God, then you have the authority and the right to command whatever you want to do. And this is really important because Jesus himself says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. He says, I do nothing of my own, only what I see the Father doing. So either, God's, either Jesus is lying or he's telling the truth. So basically every single thing he does, God does. Nothing more, nothing less. I think we seem to, again, we seem to interpret Jesus' miracles as, well, every single way he went, he healed everyone. But when we look at the pool of Bethesda, Bethesda there, were the, there were loads of people there because we knew there was a superstition that if the waters moved, that there was an angel there. If you got, if you went in, you know, you got healed. And so when Jesus was there, there were loads of kind of, you know, paralytic people and, sorry, paralyzed people and, you know, infirm people there. But we're only told that he healed one person. Only one person. And when the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus, Jesus was being thronged by a crowd of people Yet this one woman, this one person, because God healed her, Jesus was like, oh, who got healed? And so when you start to look at Scripture through these eyes, through this lens of what Jesus himself has said, everything I do is only because what God himself does. Then we understand that it's not just a case of Jesus going around going, you know, like Harry Potter and pointing here and you get healed, you get healed, you get healed, you get healed. <sighs> kind of like we see with Benny Hinn getting his jacket out and smacking people. No, it's only those people which God himself, God the Father, wants to heal. Does he heal? But, but we see Satan tries to attack Jesus. He tries to use this against him, or at least to try to ensnare him, to use his one of his three-pronged attacks to cause Jesus to sin. And even to try and buttress the point, 
and this is the whole point as well, he uses the Bible to try and entice him. He quotes from Psalm 91 and says, you know, has he not given his angel charge over you? And again, just to, re to reiterate the point is that he does exactly what currently we try and what a lot of word of faith people do. They take a text out of context, without its context, you're left with a pretext. And that truth then becomes a lie. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. And so, as you, as you will have noticed with that particular passage, he doesn't fully quote it either. Because the full quotation is, and they will guard you in all your ways. So the true context of that passage is, is God is talking about his enduring protection over his people. All their ways. As we read in the book of Daniel 12, 1, he says that he, he sent the angel Michael, basically the guardian over Israel, as it were. So he's taking this passage where God is talking about his enduring protection of his, his people, and he's trying to appropriate it to, you can do what you want now because God has said it in his word. And this is the danger about not reading the full context of Bible passages. And the irony is, is that Jesus denies it. Jesus, sorry, not Jesus denies it. Jesus refutes this and says, you should not put your God to the test. God, you're not, the very thing that what, what the faith people are doing, that be healed. Is, God said, don't do that. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't put the Lord of God to the test. Don't put me on trial, some performing monkey. Do not do it. He says expressly, do not do it. And then when we read at the very, at the end of the trial of the temptations, what happens? The angels came and ministered to him. And this is the point that it was God's timing. When God's timing was right, God then sent the angels to minister to him. We sometimes skip over that end and we just say, oh, the angels came to see him. But that's the whole point is, is that Jesus did not bum rush the system. He did not go ahead of God and yield and say, yeah, I want it now. He waited for God's timing and God's timing was perfect. And so when the time was right, God then sent the angels. So this is the point we need to prick up on that, especially in like, on that episode in the wilderness, is that Jesus showed that you, if you submit to the will of the Father, everything will work out perfectly for you. Don't try and go ahead of God. Don't try and succumb to the, the three-pronged attack of the enemy, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. But if you rest and stay in God, as we're told to bring our petitions before God, he will answer us in his way, because his ways are perfect. And the, the irony is, is that the foundation of the word of faith through dominion theology is the basic lie that Satan sold Eve in the garden. And it's exactly the same thing that he sells to us time and time again. Let's go and look. Let's go and look in Genesis 3. What is it? How does he tempt say, um, Eve? Well, we've talked about the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of the pride of life. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, pride of life. She took of its fruit and ate. Can we not see that God has spoken the end from the beginning? Satan's mo his MO, his way of tempting us, is made manifest in the very first temptation. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And that's how man fought. And so we really need to read our Bible with understanding and see that at the heart of the lie, the heart of this lie is found in the previous verse. It's what it's to, to be like God. For God knows that in that day that you eat of, the, eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this is why word of faith and dominion theology, as I round up, is, is dangerous. It is it's essentially the repackaging of the lie told in the Garden of Eden, dressed up in Christianity. It basically, it's, it's car, it basically, it's, it tries to diminish the omniscient authority of God and elevate the status of man at the same time to a level which God never created him for. And when the Bible says that we're made in God's image, it means just that, we are his image. When I look in the mirror and I see my image, my image does exactly what I do. Can you imagine the horror? You looked into your mirror and your reflection starts doing its own thing. Well, that's witchcraft. I mean, I've had a dream where that's happened, and believe me, it was probably one of the most demonic dreams I've ever had. And God ministered to me and showed me something in that dream that 
essentially they, it was all a witchcraft practice that was actually kind of confirmed by um, speaking to someone, an elder in the church. That's the whole point, is that we're made in God's image, but we only do what God does. We don't do anything of our own accord, because that's what an image does. But the likes of Creflo Dollar, it says that we're not actually human beings, that we are gods. There is no other book to dress that up. That's blasphemy. I mean, even even the Mormons believe that we'll eventually become gods. They don't believe that we're gods now. At least they you know, have the foresight to say, well, we're not quite gods now. Whereas, you know, the likes of, of Copeland, Hinn, Hagen, you know, they all have they all take their roots from Kenyan and this mysticism, this Eastern mysticism that has been blended with Christianity and forged this word of faith heresy. So, in conclusion, my biggest gripe with this doctrine is, is essentially how it shipwrecks faith. Essentially, if your faith is in faith, then and you see yourself as the king's kid and that you are gods on earth, then by extension, a god should never be sick and a god should never be poor. And if you base your faith and your existence on a belief that the Bible is not expressly said, then essentially you are in danger of immediate or permanent disaster. Because if your faith is in faith and your faith doesn't come through, what are you left with? And I've seen, I've heard personally, and I've had recollection of people whose faith have been shipwrecked because I believed in this, didn't come through, God's not a good God. I've been praying for this for, for years, it didn't come true, God can't be true. I've seen people who have sold everything, lost their parents, sorry, lost their family, lost their kids, lost their wife, and eventually take their life because some preacher came along and said, God told me to say you do this. Just sow into this ministry and the God will get, do this for you. If you just have faith to believe, it'll be yours. Just claim it. Grab it and blab it and grab it. It's yours. I mean, I'd advise you to go and watch, um, oh, I, I forget the name of the, um, the, uh, the film, the, um, Oh, yo, 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 I'll try and put a caption up to remember it. Oh, my goodness me, I've forgotten the name. Sorry, it's a bit late in the day and my brain is a bit scrambled. Um, I can't remember, but it's, it's a famous, they've made a second one. It's got a whole series of um, um, evangelical and Baptist ministers basically talking about essentially the, how the word of faith has shipwrecked many faiths. Um, and I advise you to watch it. I'll put the, I'll hopefully put a caption at the bottom to try and, to, to prompt you guys, but essentially this is it. This is the, please, I would, I would encourage us to read our Bible, read the passages that we hear time and time again in its full context so we understand what the Bible is actually saying. The, the biblical understanding of faith is belief in God sub and submitting to his will. That's what faith is. Faith is not believing for stuff and praying hard enough that it comes through. That's wrong. Because then the onus is put on you because if the man of God says, God promised it, and I can't lie, and God can't lie. If it's not made manifest, then whose fault is it? But the Bible never says that. And I pray that hopefully these little talks and these little kind of um, presentations will hopefully give us more ammunition to go back and read our Bibles with understanding that it may be well for us, and we can refute these arguments. And hopefully our faith can grow, especially as, as times get darker, and it seems there's a separation between the apostate church and the remnant church so god bless and have a good rest of the day bye bye